Okay, thanks everyone for joining. Um, and we have all of our panelists now ready. And I, I can see quite a number of you have already joined uh, as participants. Um, maybe if you allow me, I just have a, a one minute or two just to be sure everybody's on board. I think everybody's gradually coming on board. So thank you all. Good afternoon or, or good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, joining this launch of the Trade and Environment Division's pub new publication, short answers to big questions on the WTO and the environment. Um, we will be taking you through the publication and we will have a panel as well to get their perspectives on, on this publication and we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers. Um, and there will be a presentation by, by Danielle Ramos uh, on the publication itself. But to, before we start with the panel and the presentation, I'd like to introduce uh, our Deputy Director General, um, Alan Wolf. Um, Alan Wolf is the Deputy Director General who is overseeing the Trade and Environment Division. And he will be kicking us off this afternoon with um, some remarks, some opening remarks on, on this relationship between trade and environment. Um, I, We'll have a few more sort of more housekeeping type announcements, but I don't want to delay Alan. I know he he's quite, uh, has a busy schedule, so thank you very much for joining us. And I, I'll just go straight to Alan now and then pass the floor over to him for, for his remarks. So thank you, Alan. Thanks for making the time to join us. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. Um, good afternoon and welcome uh, to the launch of uh, the uh, WTO's booklet entitled Short Answers to Big Questions on WTO and the Environment. Uh, it's very timely in a number of ways. One of them is that uh, if you look at uh, the op-ed page of today's uh, Financial Times, uh, there's an article by um, Huiyang uh, Wang uh, that points out that areas where uh, two superpowers that are uh, confronting each other in some areas uh, can cooperate with each other in the area of uh, the environment. So uh, this is very ripe for discussion. So I'd like to thank Daniel Ramos and Ludovin Tamiotti, uh, who are the main authors of the booklet, as well as colleagues from the Trade and Environment Division and other divisions in the House who made contributions to it. And I think you've done a great job. Uh, environmental issues are woven into the history of the multilateral trading system. But the role of trade in the WTO on the environment is complex, and as a result, it's not always well understood. Is trade good or bad for the environment? Does the WTO prevent governments from protecting the environment? How can the WTO support its members' efforts to green their economies? These are very important questions which deserve our close attention not least because they are linked with broader efforts to restore confidence in a WTO that lives up to the spirit and letter of the Marrakesh Agreement, its founding document. In its opening paragraph, the Marrakesh Agreement enshrines sustainable development as an overarching principle of the WTO. A WTO that contributes fully to the achievement of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The agenda looks to trade and the WTO to turn the 17 sustainable development goals into reality. And a WTO that continues to develop uh, benefits reaching far and wide as ever more frequent and extreme weather events expose the vulnerability of supply, transport, and distribution chains that make trade possible in the first place. The debate on trade and the environment is likely to become even more prominent in the years ahead. One big reason is the COVID-19 pandemic, which has made very clear how nature, human health, and the economy are intimately connected. Many have argued that environmental degradation, such as biodiversity and habitat loss and climate change will make potential zoonotic outbreaks like COVID-19 more common in the future. That is transmission of disease from animals to humans. 
Others have noted the disruptions to our lives from the pandemic might be a sign of what is to be expected in a climate affected future. The backlash from nature is all around us, from wildfires and droughts to hurricanes and floods. Calls for ambitious action to safeguard our environment, especially from young people, are growing louder by the day. At the same time, the pandemic has put huge additional strains on the global trading system. In fact, on the whole global economy. Trade tensions are on the rise and continued escalation risks having a major economic impact. How we respond will be crucial because an effective and strong trading system needs to be a key part of the global response to the pandemic and efforts to build back greener and better. The short answers to these big questions in the booklet that we are launching today serve as signposts that can guide us on the road towards a WTO that works better for people, planet, and prosperity in the 21st century. I'd like to highlight three key elements that are outlined in the booklet. The first is that trade and environmental sustainability have always been and will remain closely intertwined. The booklet reminds us that governments already use trade measures to achieve environmental goals. Examples of measures include preferential tariffs for green goods, energy efficiency requirements for household products, licensing schemes to limit trade in endangered animals and plants, taxes on hazardous chemicals, and incentive schemes for low carbon technologies. What's more, our data at the WTO show that this trend has been intensifying over time. Today, almost one in six notifications of trade measures to the WTO are related to the environment, compared to one in 12 when the WTO was created 25 years ago. So we can't shy away from the debate on trade and environmental sustainability. There is a responsibility that must be borne by the whole international policy community to listen to concerns, find solutions, and facilitate collaboration, not just among governments, but also consumers, the private sector, and other stakeholders. The idea of today's publication can be traced back to the 2018 event that kicked off the WTO and UNEP partnership. WTO and UNEP have joined forces to provide a platform for interested stakeholders from all sectors of the society to exchange ideas, showcase successful experiences, and improve understanding of how trade can more effectively help bring about sustainable development. This brings me to a second signpost. WTO rules have not prevented governments from adopting measures to tackle environmental challenges. This booklet distills the very complex legal questions that have arisen in some environment related WTO cases into a very few considerations. In environment related WTO cases, the environmental goal was never the issue. Instead, the disputes focused on the protectionist and arbitrary aspects that were alleged or found with respect to the measure in question. These protectionist aspects may in fact have worked against the goals of the measure in question by preventing trade from playing its full role in promoting the most efficient solution to a given environmental challenge. In line with this, WTO cases have shown that WTO members have full freedom to differentiate between polluting and greener products. However, in doing so, they must avoid unjustifiable or arbitrary discrimination. This is one of the key contributions of the booklet to correct serious misimpressions about the implications of WTO rules for environmental action. The third and final signpost is that protecting the environment and participating in global trade can and must go hand in hand. As the booklet notes, the impact of trade opening on the environment is complex and depends on many factors. However, closing off trade would not necessarily result in a better environmental outcome. What matters from an environmental perspective is not whether goods and their components cross national borders to reach the final consumer. What matters instead 
is the environmental impact of those goods at every stage of their life cycle, from production and packaging to transport use and disposal. We may achieve a better environmental outcome by producing goods wherever it's most environmentally efficient to do so and allowing trade to match global supply and demand. This requires trade approaches that pull us in the direction of sustainability. A growing number of WTO members recognize fully that reality. We have seen a marked increase in the level of engagement in the Committee on Trade and Environment, a unique forum at the WTO dedicated to enhancing our dialogue on trade and environment issues. Partly as a result, we've seen the rise of coalitions around specific environmental topics, such as the circular economy, plastic pollution, fossil fuel subsidy reform, and clean technologies. This is the right way to go because trade policies have a huge potential to support sustainability. The current crisis calls for a collective response on trade that fosters sustainability, inclusiveness, and resilience. The WTO Secretariat here is here to support all WTO members in their search for flexible, creative, and pragmatic solutions. The booklet we are releasing today is an effort in that direction. So thank you very much for joining us. I look forward to the discussion. Thanks very much, Alan. Thanks very much for those remarks for really uh, framing our discussion this afternoon. I realized when I started, I forgot to actually show you the booklet. So I don't know where you can see it. Yes, but this is the booklet and which uh, Danielle will be speaking more about. Alan's already laid out, I think, the, the whole spectrum of, of reasons why we wanted to produce this booklet and why we thought this is a, a very needed um, piece of information. Of course, this is not the first booklet that WTO has produced. There, there has been many publications in the past uh, on trade and environment, and they range from booklets to books to, to more major research studies. So what makes this different from all the other publications that, that we've had? And I, and I think Alan already referred to it. It's, it's to try to make the discussion that we're having today on trade and environment uh, relevant to a much bigger audience. Uh, sometimes explaining WTO agreements, uh, explaining trade policy, gets bogged down in a lot of uh, technical jargon and, and requires a certain degree of, of uh, legal background. So we try to put ourselves in, in the position of the reader and try to, to ask uh, in this book, what are the three or four or five big questions that people have? And how could we answer these questions in a, in a concise way, but yet uh, informative manner? And, and again, um, we, we thought there was a big demand for this, and, and this was uh, expressed even at the high-level panel that we had with UN Environment. Um, as, as Alan said, you know, WTO and UN Environment work in partnership on, on many different things. Uh, one thing that we've been coming together on over the last few years is to have a deeper and better dialogue on trade and environment. At one of our panels, a, a leadership dialogue, uh, one of the speakers uh, there, Bertram Pika, actually, uh, had a very interesting discussion with our former Director General, Roberto Azevedo. And, and the question was really, really put forward very simply, like, why doesn't WTO produce more information that people can understand in an easy manner? Um, and, and so this is an effort, this is an attempt to go down in this direction. Um, we realize, of course, we may not have been comprehensive enough for some, maybe we have not covered everything. Um, so we also understand that this is, a, is very much a conversation starter. It's, a, it's something that we know that, you know, could be deepened in many different ways, but I think it's important to start uh, at least to get this, this dialogue going. It builds on also on more than 25 years of, of work and discussions in the Committee on Trade and Environment. Uh, it builds upon um, dispute settlement cases, and it raises um, really quite complex legal, economic, and policy issues. Um, but I think behind all of the, the booklet is a wish to ensure that we communicate better, 
uh, to put a better perspective on the relationship between trade and environment, and if I can say a, a positive relationship on how we can build bridges to ensure that trade serves uh, uh, better in achieving environmental goals, or let's put it even beyond that, to sustainable development goals. So with those very introductory remarks, you know, I, I like to pass the floor on to Daniel Ramos, who, who really was the, the author behind this booklet, and to ask Daniel if he could help take us through the book. So Daniel, please, please uh, take the floor. Thank you, Ho. Um, let me share my screen so you can see the presentation I prepared. Hopefully you can see it, let me, okay. So yes, uh, thank you, Ho. Uh, I'll just take the opportunity to also thank uh, Ludvin Tamioti and all of our other colleagues who contributed to this effort. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, it was by no means easy. Uh, normally we, we have a joke, especially among lawyers, we, we ask um, to be excused that we couldn't make anything shorter. As, as you know, short is much harder than longer answers. Um, but in any case, the, as, as Ho mentioned, the idea for this publication um, comes because we, when engaging on the very, very complex debate of trade and environment, there are a few questions that we are constantly asked. And there are a few pieces of information that are um, quite useful to start to have an informed debate. So the publication was built around five of these uh, big questions. And of course, under each one of these questions, there are uh, a few other questions that are also key that we also often hear and that we try to provide a few elements uh, for a discussion. This by no means is a, a you see, you can already download the publication in our website. It's a very short booklet. So it, it's not, um, its aim is not to go deep into any of these questions. It's really meant to be a conversation, conversation starter. So how could we produce something that is easily digestible and, and could help start a debate over these issues? So for the next minutes, I will go through uh, these questions, and this is how the booklet is structured. I won't be able to go into detail in, in any of them, and I won't be able to cover one, which is question four. Um, in a sense, it is good because it, it forces you, uh, the, our audience, to also download the publication. I will dedicate a little bit more time on questions one and three. If we start with this, first big question, and, and, and it's correct that we do so, what are the links between trade and the environment? It quickly becomes clear that the discussion is very complex. Now, we can say uh, in one hand that trade by boosting growth and economic activity, that's the idea behind why you would trade among nations because you can produce more uh, of, of the things that you do well and, and exchange those things among countries and this leads to increased wealth, right? And it, trade has contributed to an unprecedented reduction of, of poverty levels. And it has led to uh, achieving the millennial goal uh, of reduced poverty, halving poverty uh, before the deadline. So that's good. But on the other hand, uh, by boosting this growth, by boosting economic activity, it also boosts the negative environmental effects uh, that we see of traditional economic development so far. And with that, it raises also concerns about nature capacity to cope with them. This is uh, why we've been uh, rediscussing and re-examining economic growth, uh, because we know now very clearly the impacts that unsustainable economic uh, activity can lead to. And this, of course, is related to trade. Uh, again, on one hand, trade also means 
technology advancements. Uh, trading goods, trading technology, it is a way of having access to this new technology that can be environmentally friendly technologies that can allow for countries to leapfrog uh, some of the development pains that we've seen uh, with the environmental impacts uh, by having access to renewable energy, to less pollutant uh, technologies. And it also leads to efficiency gains because it promotes um, the most efficient way of producing uh, something or, or um, a value. Uh, we also see through trade uh, gains that could have environmental um, positive effects. Uh, we see that with the use of water in agriculture uh, and other areas as well. Again, if you look at the other side, trade depends on transportation, which at current technology means more pollution, right? So you might uh, lead to the notion that trade per se, because it requires this transportation, will be a net negative to, to the environment. All of this is to say what uh, uh, our delegates in the Committee on Trade and Environment know very well. The issue uh, is very complex. And what our role in the WTO, in this aspect, is exactly that, to help delineate these different aspects of the topic and try to find solutions to avoid or diminish the negative sides and improve the positive sides. In a sense, trade can be thought of as a big amplifier. It will amplify the economic activity that you see, it will allow with the pricing in a, the, the, the pricing signals in an economy to find the most efficient solutions. But if those pricing, if those policies are not correctly indicating towards an economic growth that is sustainable, it can also improve that tendencies. So in a sense, the whole discussion here uh, at the WTO in the context of trade and environment is what are the policies, the trade policies that we can identify that would help align those signals to ensure that trade can play its role and offer the best, most efficient solution to the sustainable development challenges that are posed. It is, it is not an easy uh, task, but it's a very, very important task. Of course, on, on that discussion, uh, we cannot avoid the issue of transportation. So a big part of discussing uh, the relationship between trade uh, and the environment is looking at the impact of transportation on uh, the environment. Now here, very important it is to differentiate between different modes of transportation. Um, if we only, because different modes of transportation will have different impacts, uh, on the environment. If we only look at emission intens intensity, for instance, how much uh, greenhouse gas emissions each mode of transportation has, you already have a very different picture. So first, bulk shipping, transporting goods with those big containers, uh, has an emission intensity of two grams of CO2 on average per ton per kilometer of goods transported. If you look at uh, diesel fuel trucks, a very common uh, means of terrestrial transportation, it has 127 grams of CO2 per ton per kilometer transported. So you already see there a huge gigantic difference between transporting goods from uh, by sea and transporting by land. Finally, the most intense mode of transportation in terms of emissions are short haul aircraft. Uh, of course, the longer hauls have smaller uh, footprints, but in here for the short haul aircraft, it, you will have an emission intensity of 1,700 grams of CO2 per ton per kilometer. So you already see that when you're talking about the impact of trading and transporting a good to one can, from one place to the other will have a very different uh, impact depending on distance and depending on mode of transportation. Uh, well, 
if we dig a little bit deeper, 87% of global merchandise, so global trade, uh, is carried by sea. One would say, well, fantastic, then we don't have a problem here, because if, if that's almost 90% of international trade happens by the least emission intense mode of transportation, well, we, don't, we wouldn't have so much problem. Well, it's relative because uh, even though most of trade, international trade is done by sea, uh, carbon emissions from freight transport, so transportation for trade, uh, represents around 7% of total emissions. So it is significant. And more than that, it is expected that if nothing changes, no measures are adopted, these uh, 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 emissions could increase by up to 160% by 2050. So it would become even more of a relevant source of emissions. So naturally, there are, there is, and there are uh, a lot of efforts that have to be done to decrease the emission intensity uh, of these modes of transportation. And a lot of efforts are ongoing right now to address that, uh, both at the um, International Maritime Organization to address uh, emissions from, from shipping, for instance, and a, under ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization. And we follow closely uh, those discussions because they will have an impact on the uh, efforts that we have and the discussions that we have at the WCO. Finally, uh, a final question that brings almost all of these that I'm talking about together is one of the questions that I most often hear, both in my private life and in my professional life, should we buy local? Uh, well, what I'm going to say in the next uh, few seconds and minutes, um, it's only taking into consideration the environmental impacts of our consumption. Um, there are other very important, very valid, valid arguments that can be had uh, regarding cons local consumption uh, with respect to social issues and etc. Um, I'm only looking at environmental impact. Now, if you look at the impact of buying closer to home or farther to home, the most important concept one has to have in mind is the concept of life cycle analysis. Because the transportation part of the, let's say, emission intensity or overall environmental footprint of the consumption of a good is only part of all of the elements that should be taken into account. Uh, and if one only takes into consideration the mileage behind a product, um, then you would not be necessarily having uh, the best decision in mind. And this is because for most product lines, transportation is not the main element, even when the goods are transported by air. Uh, several studies show that the transportation part of the life cycle of a good can represent anything from five to 80% of the whole uh, impact. Uh, and most product lines will fall, fall much closer uh, to the 5%. Um, just to give a concrete example, um, this is a very well-known example of a study with regards to the carbon footprint of roses uh, consumed in the UK. So the analysis was made comparing the carbon footprint of roses being imported by air from Kenya into the UK, where compa when compared to the same amount of roses being imported by sea, so the least intense uh, in emissions, um, much closer to home from an European country. If you only look at the transportation, of course, the flowers from Kenya are being flown much more uh, distance and the impact would be bigger. But when doing a life cycle analysis, it was demonstrated that the flowers being imported by sea from the European country had up to 16 times more uh, carbon emitted embedded on them. 16 more times. And why that? Because the transportation only represented a very small part of the impact. 
the way the flowers were produced, uh, the fact that the flowers in the European country were produced in uh, um, uh, greenhouses using energy at, at the time, the energy matrix for that production was fossil fuel based, meant that those flowers would, were much more intense in emissions. And that's just one simple example to show that a very well-intentioned but uninformed consumer that was making its, his or her decision only based on the transportation and maybe the distance um, would adopt the worst uh, the option, at least now only speaking specifically in terms of emission intensity in uh, CO2 footprint. So in this discussion, the most important thing is correct information is crucial for a conscious, effective choice. And here the challenges and one of the big efforts that has to be made is how to ensure that that information can be correctly accounted for, especially when you're thinking about small and medium sized enterprises in developing countries. So there might be a place there to think about uh, technical assistance, capacity building to ensure that there is traceability, that there is, that these producers are able to account for the environmental impact of their production. That's the only way that consumers could actually correctly answer to that question. Uh, if we move on, and now, as I said, I will spend much less time on the other questions. Um, do, does the second question, do WCO commitments prevent governments from protecting the environment? Uh, here, uh, our DDG Wolf has already started providing the answer. Actually, sustainable development and the protection of the environment are central to the WCO. Uh, they are part of the very first paragraph of the founding agreement of the WTO, the Marrakesh Agreement. So you can look there, you will see at the very beginning that WCO members, when they negotiated the creation of the WCO, they put sustainable development and the protection of the environment at its center. Now, trade rules do not prevent ambitious environmental action. In fact, uh, you don't have to believe me, uh, we know that because governments are widely using trade measures for the environment. We have something we call the environmental database, uh, the EDB. And the EDB is a database that was requested by the Committee on Trade and Environment for the WTO Secretariat to compile all of these trade measures that were adopted for the protection of the environment and they were being notified to the WTO. Since 2009, WCO members have already notified from 2009 to 2018, we don't have data for 2019 yet, from 2009 to 2018, uh, 11,500 environment related measures. And you can have access to all those measures and the details on those measures in our database. Even on trade policy reviews, we see more and more aspects of the, the trade policy of countries, of members of the WTO that have a relationship with the environment. So we already have collected 7,900 environment related um, entries in trade policy review of WCO members. So not only the rules are not preventing governments from adopting trade measures to protect the environment, they are doing so and they are doing increasingly so. More and more, we see the percentage of measures grow each year. Now, if they do not prevent uh, environmental action, what do they say? Here is where I'll spend a little bit more time as well, because this is one of the biggest contributions of the book. Uh, WCO members are free to adopt environmental policies, such as environmental requirements and taxes, at the level they choose. When they say that it's at the level of protection that they choose. It's not for the WCO to determine, that's for the members to determine themselves when they adopt these measures. And that can happen even if they significantly restrict trade, even banning trade, as long as they do not introduce unjustifiable or arbitrary discrimination. Uh, what WCO rules are very, very good at is at identifying what are the protectionist elements of these measures. 
what cannot be explained or justified by the environmental objective that the member adopting the measure uh, chose uh, themselves. Now, uh, when it comes to the environment, that's the basic trust, avoiding trade measures at, of being used and ex excused to protect domestic producers. As our former director general said, uh, back in 2018, do not use WCO rules as an excuse for inaction. WCO rules allow you to go as far as you desire, uh, as long as these uh, restrictions do not introduce unjustifiable and arbitrary discrimination. And let me try to distill that a little bit further. Um, that is where, uh, as a lawyer, I can say that was where I spent months and months discussing and trying to translate 25 years of learning from disputes that were uh, held or were um, resolved at the WTO and where the rules of the WTO were, were applied and interpreted with regards to environmental measures. Um, what we have is that we have distilled a few checks, useful checks to keep in mind when a policymaker is developing a trade restrictive environmental measure. Uh, and we boil them down to four checks. What should you have in mind when looking at a trade restrictive environmental measure to ensure it is compatible with WCO rules? The first one is that whatever trade restrictive environmental measure it has to be coherent. So the trade restriction created or the difference in treatment between domestic and imported products provided by the measure has to be justified by the legitimate objective and not to protect domestic sectors. So whatever, if you're banning one product but not other, make sure that the center of the measure, the justification for that is truly environmental. So he's coherently trying to address that legitimate objective and not to protect domestic sectors. Secondly, the measure has to be mindful and holistic. The measure is part of a holistic environmental policy and takes into consideration the impact on other countries. How does that measure will impact what other countries are doing or what other regions or even the international efforts on the same topic? What is happening out there? What are um, uh, WCO members, what is the international community doing to try to address the same environmental challenge? And how does the measure, the straight measure integrates into those efforts? Is it mindful of the consequences? Is it contributing? Is it part of this uh, more uh, complex structure? Uh, thirdly, that the measure is fit for purpose. The measure has to be able to efficiently contribute to the legitimate objective in a balanced way. If there are other ways of achieving the same objective that restrict trade less, then of course you should adopt the measure that is less trade uh, restrictive or the measure has to be part of a national conservation policy that also restricts domestic production or consumption. If you're restricting trade, you should also be thinking about if it makes sense to also restrict domestic production and consumption to address the same environmental um, objective. And finally, the measure has to be flexible. There's a very good principle in the TBT agreement that relates to that, and it makes it easier to understand. Uh, under the Technical Barriers to Trade Agreement, um, there is a, a principle that members should try when developing these measures to base technical regulation on, um, on, on uh, their effects uh, rather than on descriptive characteristics, on what they are trying to achieve, performance of the product rather than describing exactly what it is. And that's because there might be other uh, uh, very intelligent people, very clever people who faced with the same challenge has a different way of solving it. So the measure has to be flexible enough to accept 
that others will have other means and other ways of protecting the same objective. You, the WSO members are free to determine how much they want to protect, but they should be able to allow for others when exporting their products to the country to show that they arrived at the same result just in a different manner, maybe less costly manner. They, the measure has to be flexible enough to accept that. In the publication, we, all, we give you concrete examples of environmental measures uh, that had maybe components that didn't make sense, that couldn't be explained by the environmental objective. And what we see in this 25 years uh, of disputes is that the environmental objective was never the issue. The issue with the few measures that were considered not to be compatible with WSO rules was uh, arbitrary element, a protectionist element. And once, one could argue, once those elements were stripped from the measure, what you had was a more coherent, more complete environmental measure that more completely protected the environment and oftentimes even restricted more trade than the initial measure. But at least at the end, even restricting more trade afterwards, it did so in a coherent, in a complete way protecting the environment. As I said, uh, uh, the, the, I think distilling this, and this was a, a, a phrase that I thought was very important to have in the publication, is that the lesson that we take from all of this is that members can differentiate between polluting and green, greener products, but must avoid this unjustifiable or arbitrary discrimination. When you hear the principle of non-discrimination, always think when you're talking about environmental measures that the discrimination itself is not necessarily a problem, is whether the discrimination is unjustifiable or arbitrary. In that sense, for us, discrimination is not the same as differentiation. Yes, WTO members can and do differentiate between polluting and greener products. So I won't go into number four and I'll finish with number five and then we can hopefully have a good discussion. What is the role of the WTO in all of this, in furthering members' environmental policies? And here we have three main points. First, uh, the WTO, in ensuring a rules-based trade, ensures also that trade can play its role by allowing for the most efficient measures, the most efficient solutions for the sustainability, the sustainable development challenges that we have. The WTO advocates for rules-based trade, not, not free for all trade. WTO members have not abdicated their rights to adopt uh, very forward-looking, very ambitious environmental policies, but they have agreed that while pursuing those measures, they have to do so in a coherent, in a fit-for-purpose way. And by providing this predictability and ensuring that protectionism will not be introduced through the back door, uh, it contributes to a more effective and coherent environment-related trade policies. The second point is that the WTO is a forum for debate. Um, just to mention one committee, a very special committee, the Committee on Trade and Environment, uh, this is a place where WTO members come to have the kind of discussion we are having today and try to find um, ways in which trade policies and environmental policies can work together towards sustainable development. And just to give you a few examples of the types of, of complex issues that were discussed in the committee, uh, in the past, uh, members have discussed carbon footprint schemes and calculations, uh, trade elements of climate mitigation and uh, adaptation policies, their nationally determined contributions, um, fossil fuel subsidies reform, uh, eco labeling schemes and market access, illegal logging uh, efforts uh, to combat illegal logging, um, to combat illegal and regulated under um, reported fishing, and most recently, circular economy and addressing plastics pollution and, and what is the role of trade there. So it is a forum very unique, um, very, there are very few places where trade and environmental policies come together to be discussed. And I, I truly believe it's, it's good to see that delegates are using 
uh, more and more the committee for that purpose. And finally, we at the Secretariat, we have a mandate to collaborate with the Secretariats in multilateral environmental agreements and, and in the environment side. Our publication provides several recent examples of this collaboration. Uh, of course, we have to, to do more. Um, that's why this platform that we uh, started two years ago with UN Environment, I'm very happy to have Anya today here, uh, is very important because we need to We've done a lot, but we need to do much more to help uh, our uh, members better understand these policies, what is happening outside the WCO with respect to environmental challenges, and help understand what is the role of trade uh, in these aspects. So with that whole, uh, I pass uh, back to you. Let me stop sharing my screen. Uh, thanks very much. I know you could probably speak for the next two hours about all of those questions, but you know, thanks for, for giving us a run through in a very concise and structured way. And actually, I think you've really provoked quite a lot of questions. Um, I, I've already been receiving through the chats, um, the, the different questions that people have. But before we get to the questions, I'd like to introduce the panel. Um, got a great panel here. and and. Let me start with, you know, uh, telling you who's on the panel. We've got Damaris Canal, who's uh, the Swiss delegate to the WTO. Uh, she's particularly also a, a delegate to the WTO Committee on Trade and Environment. Um, she's got a very impressive CV. Uh, I won't read all of it, but to say that she's certainly uh, one of the key people here in WTO thinking about trade and environment. And, and she's working very actively on many of the issues that uh, Daniela is speaking about. Um, we also have Devra Bratta Chakaborty, who is the, the delegate for the, for the Bangladeshi mission to the WTO. He's also a delegate to the WTO Committee on Trade and Environment. He's a commercial counselor. He represents Bangladesh in the WTO and UNCTAD, very experienced in trade negotiation and development issues. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Alice Tipping. Uh, she's from the International Institute for Sustainable Development, uh, where she's the lead on fishery subsidies. I think fishery subsidies ensures that she spends a lot of time at the WTO. It's a very active and busy negotiation. Um, and so she's directly in this, uh, this world of trying to make trade work for the environment. Um, and she's done a lot more than, than work at IISD. She was formerly also uh, um, delegate and legal advisor to New Zealand's permanent mission and is very experienced on many of these interfaces between trade and, and sustainable development. Uh, last but not least, our, our colleague from UN Environment uh, and our partner on many things, uh, Anja von Moltke. She's head of the Environment and Trade Hub. Uh, we've worked on different things together, including the, the high-level dialogue and, and platform that has been referred to already. Um, Anya heads the Environment and Trade Hub at UN Environment. Um, she very much, as the, as, the, as the hub says, is really at this interface between trade and environment. Um, and she works across a whole range of issues, uh, from climate change to fish to plastics pollution, circular economy. So thanks very much, Anya, for, for joining me. So I'd like to start with Damaris, if I can, um, and ask Damaris, Actually, it's a question for, for all the panelists, actually, and it, it comes down to really two points, um, which is your reflections on the booklet. Uh, how do you see it? How would you use it? And of course, are there questions that you think that we should have explored or could explore further? Maybe a sequel uh, to, to this booklet. So think about that. And maybe coming more to what do all of you see in the short and medium term, that would be the most important steps to improve the relationship between trade and environment. Uh, and here I'm talking really about initiatives, things that can actually be taken up, and, and how could this support sustainable development? So um, those two points, if, as, as you think about it, I'll pass on to Damaris. So please, Damaris. Thank you very much, uh, Ho, and let me first uh, congratulate you and the Secretariat for the very useful and uh, timely publication. Um, 
I'm really happy to participate to this discussion. I think it's good that we're having more and more conversation uh, on trade and environmental uh, sustainability. I think this is uh, uh, really needed. And uh, just for this, I think uh, your publication in itself is, is a success as it's bringing uh, different stakeholders um, around the table, so to speak. Um, I will first highlight maybe what are the three main takeaways for me from this publication um, and then um, uh, also offer some reflection as we were also asked on what is it concretely that could be done to improve relationship between trade uh, and environment. Um, so, you know, a number of things have already been said, but I think um, uh, really I think we lost the Maris, maybe the network is not good. Um, oh. Can we send a message to the Maris? I don't know, Danielle, who's somebody, somebody I'm, not, I'm not sure whether she's aware that uh, it's not. Yes, I'll, I'll send her a message. Is she still frozen or is she back? Can you hear me? We lost you for a few minutes, I'm afraid. Okay, so <laughs> so where did you like? Where was I? Um, so maybe I can just uh, uh, go back to the three main takeaways uh, uh, from the publication. Uh, uh, um, so I, I think uh, too often we oppose trade and, and environment, and uh, uh, the the fact of framing the debate in a simplistic manner also prevent the different communities, uh, the trade community and other communities to even engage. Um, and, and I think um, we cannot highlight enough how uh, the fact that trade does not prevent ambitious environmental objectives and also the fact that uh, uh, trade can and also must uh, promote environmental objectives. So I think this is uh, uh, one of the key takeaway from, uh, uh, from your publication. The other, uh, uh, the second one that I think is also very important is the importance of international cooperation um, and also highlighting what the WTO can do. Because uh, uh, if we are to address those global challenge uh, uh, um, in a coherent and transparent and uh, fair manner, we'll need to have forum uh, to discuss. And I think this is wh why uh, we have set up multilateral institution and we need to use them more uh, for that purpose. And the third um, um, takeaway from, from this publication, which is also very important, is that we can also turn these challenges into opportunities. Um, often we hear that uh, um, we also, the same way that we say trade and environment, it's also the same with the economy in general. We, we only see as uh, um, promoting environment as something that is costly for the economy and we don't realize that uh, uh, it can also be an opportunity and uh, uh, we need also to frame the discussion um, in, in that manner, I would say, especially um, uh, when we're thinking about the current crisis and the need to build uh, back better. So, uh, unfortunately, she's frozen again. Oh. But have any of you the training on how to conduct webinars? What do you do in such a situation? I think you wait a second. If, if she is not back, you can move to the next um, panelist. I, I think I might have to, because I think I'm not sure where the Maris is. So, um, oh, she's there. Is she back? Is she online again? Sorry, Damaris, we, we lost you again as you, as you finish your third Take home. Um, I don't know whether you, that you had more. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I tried to check the network. It seems to work. I can always hear you, but uh, so I'm very sorry for this. Uh, I, I reloaded the, the Wi-Fi, but uh, uh, let's see if it's uh, uh, stable enough. Sorry for, for, for this. 
Um, so on the concrete things um, that we can uh, uh, that we can do, and I, I'm, I'm sure Alice will also speak more uh, on this, but I think one of the concrete things is clearly to uh, conclude and agree on a meaningful outcome on fisheries subsidies by the end of the year, as um, um, we have the mandate to do so, not only from the SDGs, but from our own uh, ministerial uh, declaration from uh, MC11. So I think this is one uh, very concrete thing. But I also think we need some sort of a renewed commitment that the multilateral trading system needs to um, uh, contribute to broader objectives such as SDGs, environment and climate. Um, I think it's a given that we need to align trade policies with the Paris uh, climate objectives and ambition. But I think it's also fair to say that um, at this stage, at least uh, this is our position, the trade community has not been uh, very vocal and active on, on, on the issue. And uh, I think it's really time that uh, um, uh, we engage more in this, as it was uh, recalled by uh, previous speakers. It is part of the WTO uh, Marrakesh Agreement and it should be front and center, but I think uh, we need to give it a little bit more attention um, in the WTO context. Um, and. After this, I think, uh, uh, and as was highlighted by, by Daniel, um, issue right, uh, It's a shame. I don't know. I think she had really interesting points. But unfortunately, um, the, the network doesn't seem to be, be uh, constant. Um, It's really unlucky. Maybe I suggest we move on to add to actually to Dev Deva Brata with uh, my thinking that we have Switzerland and we go to Bangladesh and then we pick up Alice and then and, and Anmo. Um, and as you, as Deborah Brata is talking, maybe I can really throw it for you to think about, not to answer yet, some of the questions that I'm already getting through the emails or through the chats. There's lots of questions about carbon border tax adjustment and WTO rules. So I think that's really one sort of big area of discussion. What, what can one do uh, in WTO vis-a-vis uh, -vis carbon border tax adjustment? Quite a number of questions for further clarifications on Article 20 and, and how can that actually work uh, with respect to environmental exceptions? Some questions as to what is the definition for environment? Uh, what would come under environment? Um, I'm of course abbreviating here because the, the the questions were longer. Um, PPMs, um, are they still relevant? If they are, how are they relevant? Uh, and what's the, the, the issue behind PPMs? So sometimes there's a male that's Those who don't know what PPMs are, the product process methods, um, uh, which is what will come up. So let me stop, stop there, just think about that, and we'll come back to it. And I just will go on to, to Deborah Bratta uh, on, on those two questions, uh, broad questions and more reflections. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you well. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, for really grateful uh, to DDG Wolf for his uh, uh, excellent uh, beginning, I think, starter. Uh, Director uh, uh, Mr. Holim, uh, colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, he lost no, you. no, but can you hear me? We can hear you, but we don't oh, see you. No problem. I think, I think I can continue and then uh, let's see when the picture comes. So uh, this uh, short answers to big questions on the WTO and the environment is a good starter for a beginner like me. And I'm pretty sure that there are many, many beginner like me, beginners like me. The short compendium asks five most relevant questions from the WTO's perspective. And there are also responses to those questions in an easy language. This is a difficult job done. And I must congratulate my colleagues in the TED uh, of the WTO. So trade today largely, all we know that depends on GVC and the impact of trade, that's why our uh, Trade and, on trade and environment is complex and, and multifaceted. So are we exploiting nature too much? I think that should be our central and guiding question. 
and you know that here comes uh, Gandhi's great quote and what I have seen also the background of D.D. Jules, uh, Gandhi, uh, that the world has enough to meet everyone's need, but not everyone's greed. And uh, we cannot, we cannot, uh, we have unlimited, we, we, we don't have unlimited resources on art. So uh, on the other hand, we cannot also survive without doing trade, neither by restricting trade. So the best solution is our behavior. And that I truly believe that responsible behavior into the detail because my colleague Daniel has excellently uh, I mean analyzed this book and also director Fulim but uh, two or three things uh, I think some uh, some phrases that well put here very well put here for example uh, the trade rules are not excuse for inaction or discrimination discrimination is not the same as differentiation these I consider as I mean trade related maxims superb thank you for putting this now, uh, uh, putting from the LDC perspective for where I come, uh, that of course LDCs uh, face uh, some critical challenges and WTO has some support measures. Still, uh, we don't have the viable technological base. Uh, that is one of the issues. Plus, uh, the, the capacity is another issue. The administrative and judicial capacities are all lacking uh, most of the LDCs and developing countries. Uh, and if the environmentally friendly industrial goods are too costly, uh, this simply cannot afford those. This is another area. I think the book could have highlighted this area. Uh, this book could have also indicated how innovation and the process engineering uh, help developing countries, including LDCs in trade and environment. Also, this is possible to work out and make a list of uh, environmentally friendly competitive products of the LDCs. Uh, we, I know that we discussed this in the city, but uh, this is an opportunity in the second edition. Uh, if, uh, I mean, it's possible, we can add this. One thing I must note here, people in poor economies are also love nature. Many, in many societies are culturally loyal to nature, but the lore of the big, the big profits and big development compels many of them to violate their own social ethics. We must be very honest to what I call the front door transparency. I know that you have put that in your book as well, the back door transparency, but it should be more forward looking, the front door transparency. We must be, uh, we must be vocal on this. Uh, developing countries and LDCs have concerned that in the name of circular economy, that DDG Wolf has kindly also pointed out this, poor countries must not be utilized as the dumping ground of developed countries what you have put in this book as pollution heaven. I also thank you for providing a short list of selected topics recently raised at the city. This is really, really useful and helpful. Uh, finally, since I need to go and I cannot uh, stay here more, uh, my two suggestions, as you have kindly asked us in the separate question, one suggestion is that if possible to accommodate in the next edition, the book could have contained a non-exhaustive list of major environment related protocols and agreement, which have direct link to trade and environment. And that may be put with one or two or three sentences short sketch for each. And the second suggestion is uh, particularly thinking from the developing country and LDC perspective. I suggest that CTE may work on some areas of environmental technology transfer through the TRIPS Council, particularly under TRIPS Article 66.2, technology transfer opportunities, depending on the needs and relevance of the individual LDCs. This initiative can have shorter and longer implementation phases. Even technology bank for the LDCs can be involved uh, with this initiative. I trust this will help improve relationship between uh, trade and environment. Uh, so I, by your permission, I stop here. If you have, allow me, I have another meeting to go and I wish you all the best. I think I'll have the discussion summary later on. Thank you so much once again for inviting me. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chakraborty, and, and really very concrete suggestions that will, will give us some thought on how we can take these things forward. Um, I know we are a bit short of time, so I won't say much more than to introduce Alice. So Alice, tip in if you, if you would like to take the floor and offer some of your reflections. Thank you very much indeed, Holim. Can you all hear me properly? 
Yes, good. Um, well, thank you very much, Holim and, and Daniel and the, and the Trade Environment Division for, for inviting us to, to comment on this. Um, for those of you who don't know the IISD, it's a think tank um, with a large office here in Geneva that's doing an increasing amount of trade policy and sustainable development work. Um, and I personally have been following the trade and environment file and the debate in the WTO for a long time. Uh, and uh, oh, as you said at the beginning, this is not the first trade and environment publication that's come out. Um, some of you in the audience might be forgiven for thinking, well, what's different about this one? Um, it actually is qualitatively very different. And there are, th there are three things that I think it's, it's, it's a really useful contribution for. The first is that it uses very simple, very accessible language, right, to describe things which are often legally and technically quite complex. Um, it has masterful use of graphics, never underestimate how useful a picture can be just to help people follow very abstract concepts. Um, and I think it's really addressing the right questions. So it addresses where there are persistent and problematic misunderstandings about the interplay of WTO rules and environmental measures. Um, and I, you know, for one, having followed the file for so long, I don't underestimate at all the amount of very careful thinking that's gone into producing this publication and making it both accurate and accessible. Um, and there are two things in it that I think are particularly helpful and Daniel, you've, you've touched on them, but just to sort of underline them. The first is that the work that's gone into distilling, as you put it, WTO jurisprudence into four plain language checks on page nine. Um, the idea that measures must be coherent, they must be fit for purpose, they must be mindful and holistic and they must be flexible. I think is extremely helpful. Um, and I was asked to say, how am I going to use this publication? Well, I'm shamelessly going to take exactly those concepts and use them in my own communication efforts because I think they're really good. Um, the second particularly helpful contribution are the four line summaries of environment, and environment related disputes that you have on page 10 of this, um, which explain what was actually at issue in each of the disputes. And it, I think there's really a continuing need for exactly this kind of communication, right? There is still an ongoing misunderstanding of what WTO disputes have decided. Uh, and this sort of ongoing sense, I think, that the WTO dispute somehow ruled against the environment, when in fact, as you rightly say, what was at issue was whether the measures were protectionist or how they were applied, whether they were applied arbitrarily. Um, and if you'll sort of forgive me, you know, I think this, this distinction is part of the philosophy that's informed appellate body and WTO decisions from the very beginning of the whole WTO. You know, if, and if you'll allow me, I just wanted to take you back to one of the very, very first environment related disputes ever decided. So the very famous shrimp turtle dispute, many of you in the audience will have heard of it back in 1998, right? And there the appellate body Sure, it found against the US's measure, but it was very, very explicit about what it was deciding and what it was not deciding, right? So it, it said, it, like the appellate body actually took the time to say, we have not decided that the protection of the environment isn't of significance to the WTO members. Clearly it is. We've not decided sovereign nations can't adopt effective measures to protect endangered species. Clearly they can and should. And they, they explicitly say, we've not decided here sovereign states shouldn't act together to protect the environment and to protect endangered species. Clearly they should and do, right? So I think from the beginning, even the beginning of the WTO, the dispute settlement system has been trying to demonstrate this respect and support for measures governments take to, to protect the environment. Um, and I think sort of somehow in the you know, in the in the in the noise of of, of the politics that surrounds these issues that underlying philosophy, which is still there, has tended to get lost, and that's a shame. Um, but that I think that philosophy is what this document and this publication helps us to remember, right? Here is as far as WTO rules go, and here is the extent to which they support measures to support the environment. Um, so, you know, could there be, could there be further work? I guess my, my sort of very short term suggestion is that I'd really encourage you, if you're not already, to turn this content into a social media campaign and use it as widely as possible. Um, maybe this is Daniel's next job for the next few weeks. But you know, the, the fact that it distills some quite complicated but extremely important policy questions into really useful accessible snapshots, I think deserves to be shared to the general public as widely as you can manage. Um, what can we do in terms of actual policy initiatives? I, I underscore, of course, being uh, kind of a bit with a particular sort of focus on fisheries subsidies. 
completing the fisheries subsidies negotiations at the WTO with a result that's environmentally meaningful, that actually shifts subsidy patterns away from overfishing uh, is one of the clearest and most tangible things the trade community can do um, in the short term. And that would be a direct contribution, of course, to the UN's sustainable development agenda. There's a specific target uh, that points to this job for the WTO. So fulfilling, completing the negotiations would be a direct fulfillment of that target. And in the medium term, you know, I think there's sort of increasing interest in talking about the role of trade and trade policy in improving access to environmental goods and environmental services taken together. Right, those two, two discussions have often been quite separate in the WTO. But if we think back again to you know, what should be sort of our, our guiding policy framework, the, the UN Sustainable Development Agenda, there's targets in there about access to clean energy, access to clean water, and also about reducing the burden of economic growth on natural resources and the natural environment. And as economic policymakers and trade policymakers, we know that to do that, governments need access to goods and services together. So I think there might be space for sort of a, a refreshed look at how you know the economics of businesses actually work and how goods and services needed are needed to together to solve some of these broader sustainable development challenges. Um, but again, congratulations Ho and, and the team for what I think is an extremely useful publication. Um, it is qualitatively different from all the ones I've read before. So congratulations, uh, and I commend it to everyone in the audience. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Alice. Again, very practical suggestions for us to consider. So that's really useful. And in a way, you already touched on some of the questions that were coming from from uh, from the audience. A, a lot of the questions are on this interface between WTO rules and environmental policy. And 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 I think when we get to the discussion again, you know, maybe useful for Danielle or some of the other panelists to talk a bit about the dispute cases. What have you actually? Uh, settled. Um, having said that, let me go to Anya, Anya von Mokke, um, you know, a, a colleague that we work with very closely from the UN environment. Um, Anya has also written many different publications on environment and trade and the relationship between the two. And, and you know, and we know we're happy that you can join this with us because you are sort of, if I can say, a joint parent of, of, the, of the need to have more uh, information out there in trade and environment. So I'm going to thank you. Thank you very much, Ho. And uh, first of all, congratulations to the WTO team, to Daniel, to Ludivin, to, to Ho and, and, and others. So I think this is an excellent piece of work. And uh, indeed, I fully agree that uh, this was one of the um, outcomes of, of the joint UNEP WTO dialogue that we held under our joint platform about two years ago, where there was a clear call by um, Bertrand Picard, as well as uh, the WTO DG and our executive director, as well as a number of ministers to really clarify some of the misunderstandings that are, that are out there that um, some of the environmental progress that is needed is actually inhibited by WTO rules. So this publication is really helpful in explaining um, how there is indeed a lot of policy space and also to emphasize the importance of international collaboration based, based on SDG um, 717. So indeed, there, there are books and guidance documents out on, on this, but I fully agree with Alice. This one is different. Um, at UNEP, we had worked with IASD in 2015 and brought out a handbook on, on green economy and trade. And that we clearly saw that there was a huge need for um, delegates to have an simple, easy access uh, information tool. And we saw them walk around a lot with, the, with this green book, um, but that was at a time when people were still carrying books and I guess still, still walking around in cor corridors, which is not happening nowadays. Um, but this one actually takes it, takes it further and it, simplif it, it makes it more simpler. And I fully agree with Alice as well on the importance of good illustrations and, and useful graphics. I will also take it um, 
to work with our countries who often come to us when they design trade policies or when they design environmental policies and ask us to what extent this could potentially conflict with WTO rules um, to, to, to inform um, uh, following these, these criteria that, that have been outlined in a, in a very um, simple and, and helpful fashion by, by Daniel. Thank you for that. Um, so I, I was also asked to um, look at how, how this could be taken further. And a lot has been mentioned already on, on issues that would need to be addressed further. Fishery subsidies, we are, we are the first to, to, to support that call. Also on carbon border tax adjustments on the um, avoidance of pollution havens on uh, MEA and WTO relationships. But I would maybe like to um, make or broaden out that question a bit more generally because what, what this publication really addresses is um, what I think you summarized, Daniel, by saying there's no excuse in the trade rules for, for inaction. I fully agree with that. Um, as a next step, maybe we could also think a bit about what kind of multilateral frameworks or rules would actually help to not only um, allow environmental action, but proactively promote the environmental dimension of SDG. I know that uh, of SDGs and I know that this is a touchy issue, um, but the booklet explains very well how um, trade and partnerships are key to SDG 17. And at the same time, it explains um, how SDG 17 is a means of implementation for environmental and development goals. So, um, I think it, this needs to be taken to a level where we could think about what kind of multilateral framework or rule would really help us to move to a responsible and sustainable consumption and production, to um, more sustainable cities, to meet the targets of the Paris Agreement, um, and to protecting natural, natural resources. So in other words, in the more, um, WTO phrasing what what kind of rules would be would be needed to really reform reform subsidies to meet these objectives in the field of fisheries in agriculture in fossil fossil fuel subsidies what kind of trade related mechanisms um, would be needed to promote and incentivize sustainable consumption and production that causes damage. Um, and how could they better be linked sustainable consumption and production and, and avoid spillovers? What kind of specific support mechanisms could be designed, particularly for those that are most in need of them, like the, the LDCs and, and the small island developing countries, to strengthen the green export sector and productive capacity in the green sector? Um, what kind of screening would we need to introduce to financial and capacity building for trade for sustainability? And finally, how, how could we promote consumer information tools and transparency and traceability that Daniel so, so, so well mentioned? Um, and I think it's really good that in this publication, we're being very honest about the environmental impacts that trade can have, particularly on the transportation side. Um, but for some trade, we also need to be honest that it really does not make sense, for example, to um, transport uh, water from Greenland to Swiss supermarkets, traveling about 10,000 kilometers um, to, 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 to be sold here in plastic bottles, emitting about 800 grams of CO2 per bottle when we have clean, water in, in Switzerland. So the, these kind of differentiated discussion um, based on scientific evidence, um, which Daniel mentioned, um, linking back to the life cycle assessment and other methodologies, I, th I think is really important. 
Now, one last point, um, what else is needed? I think we really need more involvement of the environment community as well. I think one of the delegates has said um, it's, it's a bit of a constituency free this discussion right now at the WTO on environment. So how can we promote more involvement of the environmental um, community and really get, get their, 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 their support on, on these issues? Because I think there's a lot of, um, that they, they can offer a lot of backing to, for leadership um, in, in, in the community. So maybe there, there's something that could be done also in terms of short answers to big questions, um, why trade is important for the environment. So turning the question a little bit around. I leave it at here, but thanks very much again for, for, for this great publication and thanks for allowing us to, to speak here, thanks. Th thanks a lot, Anya. I, I know the, the, there's a lot more I know we could speak about and we'll have further opportunities. I just feel a bit bad that um, I, there are so many questions and, and we haven't really even gotten to them. I'm, I'm being like an air traffic controller and doing a really bad job of it and getting questions from the chat from my and also by email. Um, so anyway, trying to, to understand these questions, I think the first one that keeps coming up is carbon border tax adjustment and W2 rule. Uh, and, and just to be, just to summarize the question, it's basically asking very specifically under what conditions could carbon border tax adjustment um, be implemented or, or designed um, and, and how could it be done in a way that's compatible with everything. I think that's a very Danielle question, although I, I don't want to put pressure on you, Danielle, but it seems to be your sort of question. So that's one question. I'm trying to go through all the questions and maybe we have one final round with, with everyone and doing as much as I can with the questions we receive. The other one, again, is a red dispute question, and it may be also, Alice, if you have a, a view on this, it's about WTO Article 20 dispute jurisprudence. And again, under what conditions can environmental measures be, be taken uh, in a way to ensure that they are not uh, unjustifiably discriminatory or they're not arbitrary. And the question really is about how do we understand unjustifiable discrimination? What, what is the, the means to understand what could be considered uh, unjustifiable discrimination? Uh, another question, a very much an Article 20 related question, but also has a link to, of course, carbon border taxes, is a question of PPMs, uh, product process methods. Can members distinguish based on, uh, on these process methods? Um, and if they can, what, what is the issue? Or is there any issue? You know? uh, and has WTO dispute settlement resolved uh, or given more clarity in PCA? More policy oriented, and it's a bit again to like, what policies can we actually do? What can we actually take forward? What can we actually conclude? Um, uh, EGA, is there hope to come back to environmental goods agreement? Alice Chicken, you mentioned the environmental services. Uh, what were the conditions that didn't let the EGA to conclusion? Um, has anything changed? Um, could, could that be possible to come back to? Uh, other types of policies, uh, subsidies. How, how do we use subsidies in a way to incentivize, uh, let's say, good environmental practices? but at the same time not uh, sort of get into problems with WTO rules. You know, what, what's the scope for using subsidies essentially? Um, and another question here was on uh, local content requirements. Uh, uh, are they a good or bad thing from, from an environmental perspective? Uh, and what is the scope for, again, WTO rules? as far as local content requirements are concerned, uh, particularly if LCRs are considered to be uh, needed to, to achieve certain environmental objectives. Um, many more, um, but let's stop with that if that's okay and then see whether we can manage two rounds. And I just be very open, I just open it up to whoever wants to, to jump in on these questions. Um, but maybe Danielle, since there's so many on carbon border adjustment and I know something that you look at 
Th thank you, Ho, and um, thank you, everybody, for participating. Uh, this this has been extremely extremely interesting and useful. And I guess we cannot complain uh, if we uh, develop a, a publication that is supposed to be a conversation starter. And so many questions have been started by this presentation. So hopefully, it's it's not bound only by this hour and a half, but we we keep on going. Um, I, I, I as you said, Ho, I. I really much rather listen from, from our colleagues who are here. Um, but just to say on, on border carbon adjustment very quickly, uh, so the, the fact of adjusting at the border for a tax or an environmental costs that is charged of domestic products, uh, it's nothing new. It is actually, we, uh, you can find in our environmental database, you can find uh, in the trade policy review of our members that it happens. Uh, it happens with other types of, of taxes, uh, of environmental taxes and environmental costs. Uh, the big question here is how to do it, is, in, is on the details. And the topic for a lawyer, for a, a legal expert is the best topic that is because it's so complex, involves so many discussions. And that's why there's so much interest, especially from legal uh, side of academia. Uh, I'll just say that there's nothing in the rules that prevent that. And actually the small points that we put there, those four checks uh, that we try to distill, they would also be relevant for a policy in that direction. But uh, again, uh, welcome to have more of these discussions and then I would love to geek it out uh, on, on specifics uh, of what should be taken into consideration. But uh, I think that's sufficient for me. Alice, would you have, would you like to pick up on any of these questions and I just make a panoramic view of? Sure, thanks. So, I mean, I can I can have a go at this question of of unjustified discrimination. Although, you know, Daniel's probably much better versed on the recent jurisprudence than I am. You know, I mean, as as far as I can recall, essentially, when you're looking at whether there's unjustifiable discrimination between trading partners, panels in the appellate body have tended to look for a couple of different things. And the first is whether the measure, whether the government imposing the measure made a, a serious effort to negotiate with its trading partners to find a way of applying, designing and applying the measure such that it could achieve its objectives um, and in, in a way that the other trading partner was more or less satisfied with. Um, so have you actually engaged with your trading partners properly in trying to find sort of a mutually agreeable option here? Um, and the second thing I, I think panels tend to look at is whether there's enough flexibility in the measure to take into account different, naturally different circumstances in different countries and different trading partners. So are you requiring absolutely everybody to do one thing one way, or are you requiring them to meet a certain objective, but giving them some flexibility about how they achieve it, for instance? So at least from, from the dim dark recesses of my memory, those are the things that panels will tend to look at in trying to work out whether a measure was unjustifiably discriminatory between trading partners. Um, and then the other sort of question on, on environmental goods is a fair one because I raised it. You know, I think as, as tends to happen in any multilateral trading environment, once you start to launch a negotiation that involves tariff reductions, it immediately becomes a bargain, right? It becomes a multilateral negotiation and countries um, will have different perspectives about what is an environmental good. Um, and they will naturally, let's be honest, be balancing environmental considerations with commercial considerations. And I think just because the, so there was a, there was a multilateral environmental goods negotiation, then there was a plurilateral environmental goods negotiation, both now currently paused. And I think the, you know, just because we haven't been able to reach a sort of a meeting of minds on exactly what a list of environmental goods for tariff reductions could be, um, does not mean that the issue should be abandoned forever, right? Economies move on, business models move on, uh, politics move on. And I think there's always uh, sort of after a couple of years as have now passed, um, there's always a justification for looking back at the list and thinking, in the current circumstance is now the right time to try again. Um, and I think what could make an environmental goods negotiation different again is the idea of looking properly at the services 
that governments might want to have access to to properly use those goods for their environmental objectives. Um, and looking not so much at kind of just tariff reductions and just market access requirements on services, but looking at them together as they actually exist and are traded in the real world and thinking, is there a way of using the trade system to facilitate access to the solutions that governments need access to, to achieve clean energy, access to clean water? Thanks. Thanks, Alice. I think that, that what you finished on was really very interesting was to you know, how, how do we change the logic of a trade negotiation? I mean, this may be a, same, a, a thing that, that, that is something worth thinking of because um, as you said, trade negotiations are set up in such a way as if they are um, uh, an exchange of trade concessions between the parties. But often what we're trying to get to when we look at trade and environment from an environment perspective is more about how can members better use trade to achieve their own environmental objectives often? And sometimes it's, well, shared environmental objectives. So it's almost a, a, a very different logic. It's not as if um, I will do this because you will do it. It's more like I will do this because it's good for me. I, I want to do this. I want to achieve something out of it. Of course, maybe that's too naive a, a beginning point, but I do think Somehow we, we, we need to rethink a little bit the, the, the dynamics in, in the way we think about negotiation. Uh, with that, maybe I go to Anya. Um, and you know, Anya, you can pick up on anything you like, but maybe from the UN environment point of view, what would be interesting, I think, to hear from you as well would be, you know, what, what types of things do you think trade policy could do more in the more positive narrative of uh, supporting environmental objectives? And there are some very pointed questions that I received which were on local content requirements. Like, are they good or are they bad for an environmental objective? Uh, uh, should we be pursuing more local content requirements or not? Um, for instance, um, eco-labeling, um, things of providing more information to the consumer. Uh, yes, that's good to provide more eco-labeling, but on the other hand, there seems to be lots of eco-labels out there. Um, uh, do all of them work for the environment? I, I don't know, one from your reflections, how do you see some of these more policy type issues? Yeah, I think, thank you. Uh, um, well, for, first of all, all the technical questions that, that have been asked already demonstrate the kind of interest and, and, and demand for, for, for these kind of very complex issues. So my first thought is um, maybe it would actually be worth um, developing sim similar easy to use guides on these specific issues on uh, circular economy, on subsidies, on uh, environmental goods and services trade, on multilateral environmental agreements, specifically on, on, on each of these, these topics. Um, then I, I fully agree with you Ho, on your observation on the need to shift the, the dynamics of the trade negotiations or discussions, because at, at the end of the day, we're talking about a, a public good here. The, the, that's, that's the environment and that's the cross-border in, environment. So we, we need to better understand what, what are the incentives for countries to preserve the environment and link that better to, to, to their trade policies. Now on the um, environmental goods and services discussions, um, Alice mentioned the, the angle of um, services that I fully agree with. Um, I think the other item that has not really been addressed in that context is the item of non-tariff barriers. So what kind of agreement could help to um, reduce non-tariff barriers, which in many cases, particularly developing countries, um, are, 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 are limited by. Um, and more broadly speaking, in the discussions that were happening on, on the um, environmental goods agreement at the time, it was mostly, not only, but mostly um, industrialized countries involved. So I think there's a need to ensure that the interest could um, 
the interest particularly of developing countries and least developed countries could be better reflected in, in these, these discussions and um, to see what kind of capacity building could be built into such, a, such an agreement to help countries fully benefit from uh, the development, innovation, use and trade in, in, in technologies. Now, other, other positive um, ways to, to, to look, at, look at trade indeed and include um, improving information and traceability systems, including voluntary sustainability standards, um, eco-labeling systems, as well as clear, um, clear guidance and regulatory systems for, for, for cleaner production and, and really establishing through trade mechanisms, the link between clean production and, and clean, clean consumption. Um, and uh, yeah, the, my, my other point is that we have seen a lot of member-driven leadership at the WTO, including by, by Fiji and China and Pakistan on uh, circular economy and on plastics, by the FAST group on many of the environmental issues related to climate change and, and broader. So I, I think it's really important to build on, on this momentum that is, that, is, that is currently there to help us tackle some of the technical issues that are often not only technical, but uh, actually much more political. So we need the political will and there's that we can create through, through those leadership groups. Thanks. Thank you, Anya. I, I sort of feel I need to come back to the panel on the issue of PPMs because it is one of these issues that I know many people are interested in. Um, I, I'm in a privileged position of being moderator, so I just asked the questions and, uh, and uh, you to the answers on, on PPMs. And anyone able to give a short answer to a big question on PPMs? <laughs> well, let, let me try. <laughs> Um, no, thank you. Hope. So, so the issue of process and production method, I think there are two ways of looking at it. One very legalistic one, and, and honestly, I think much less useful. Um, the, to, to, to tell the truth, there are only a few remaining legal questions that could um, be raised on with regards to process and production methods. Uh, but even those questions, um, they would be answered in the general scheme of things along the lines of those four questions, um, of four checks. Is the measure coherent? Uh, even if it's applying to how you produce something, uh, is it fit for purpose? Is, is it part of a broader um, holistic policy? Is it flexible? Uh, and so it wouldn't necessarily change the nature of the debate. So um, I use the opportunity here to, I, I, I joke because when, when I, I receive uh, proposals from uh, for um, master thesis to discuss PPM, I immediately say, I'm, I, that's not with me. You, you won't like my answer because it's, it, I don't see how useful more paper on that. On the other hand, there is a policy side for the PPM discussion, which I think is getting more and more relevant. And the policy side was um, mentioned by Dev or, or, or Bangladeshi delegate a little bit, uh, and, and it was by, by in some instances by, by Damaris as well, our Swiss delegate, which is um, if you are focusing more and more on the life cycle process and, and how the whole production of this product impacts the environment. And if you are linking or making discussions about market access or, or how or whether you should consume or not this product where you're putting a label, how do you account for the environmental impact in that part of the process becomes key. It has to be very disaggregated and that has a cost. And it's not clear that all producers, especially in developing uh, countries, small and medium enterprises in least developed countries necessarily have the capacity uh, and the, the, the infrastructure to do so. And this is something that we see in our technical assistance uh, trainings, uh, that how to even account, how to know the impact 
of these processes and how to certify them and be part and this more positive agenda. How can we exploit these opportunities of this green market, of these uh, green labels? How can we certify that? I think that there is a lot there that could be done and there is a lot that could be discussed among trade officials on how to support that process. I think that was not a short answer, Daniel, but it's okay. <laughs> um, I, I've gone beyond the 10 minutes, I've gone beyond the, the time allocated for, for the chat. And I noticed that uh, some of our panelists already had to leave, the Maris and the Brata had to leave as well. So I sort of think I have to bring this to a close. I, it's not going to be the end of the discussion. I'm sure there'll be other discussions, maybe some that we can host, but maybe some will be hosted by others as well. And just to announce to, to those of you who are interested in this, um, the week of 16th November will be a week where WTO will be having a so-called Trade and Environment Week. There will be the, the Committee on Trade and Environment, but there will also be a range of other events around the committee, uh, including, a, a, again, another high-level panel uh, with UN Environment and WTO, which we'll be very happy to have uh, Inga Anderson, the Executive Director, of UN Environment will be at this panel. And we've so far received uh, confirmations from the Minister of Environment, the Minister of Trade, uh, some very high level business people, uh, etc. cetera. I, I, we will be putting out all this information on our website. So for those of you interested, please uh, look, look towards it. Um, members are also hosting their own events. I think most of them will be open to the public as well. Uh, to help, we will be putting the whole program out on our website uh, uh, for, for that week. Um, a last thought I just want to leave you, answering to a technical question as such, but something I think is, is worth for people to think about, because sometimes I think we zoom in too quickly uh, to questions about whether a measure is allowed or not allowed by the WTO. To me, I don't think that's necessarily the beginning point. I think the beginning point should be more, is the measure uh, going to lead to uh, a better environmental attainment of a particular objective? Uh, you know, if, if that measure is good for a certain environmental objective, uh, that's what I think we should start with and think about it, about whether is this a good thing to be doing? Like Alice was saying, fishery subsidies. I think there it's pretty clear cut to, to everyone that removing uh, subsidies that distort the way we uh, exploit uh, natural resources, in this case fish, uh, is a good thing to do. And then the next question is, how do we get there? How do we do it? Uh, but if we do it the other way around and we keep thinking about all the legal technical issues across all range of measures, without having clarity as to which measure we want to pursue, uh, it may be great as an academic exercise, but it's very hard to, to bring about uh, initiatives. I think you have, one has to think a bit about, about the initiatives. Um, so that's just a few thoughts. And then the last thing, not, not to frighten uh, Daniel, but I think maybe a sequel could be um, long answers to short questions. So sometimes the short questions are the are the hardest ones. So uh, thank you all very much, and we look forward to keeping uh, the conversation going. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you again. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye bye.